This meeting is being recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome to our University of California virtual career series. Um, today we'll be talking about how to market your PhD for non-academic careers. My name is Michael Matrone and I am the Associate Director of the Office of Career and Professional Development at the University of California, San Francisco. Um, what we hope that you'll gain from this um, panel today is some insight into the wide variety of ways you can take your PhD into, uh, um, and leverage it for a number of non-academic career settings. We hope you can get some advice on how to position and market uh, your educational background for industry roles. Identify practical strategies to identify and connect with target employers and importantly feel feel a greater sense of connection to the University of California and its alumni network. So I'm joined today by three wonderful panelists uh, in alphabetical order. They're Joseph Bernardo, Intercultural Affairs Associate at Loyola, at Loyola Marymount University. Shruti Kapoor, who is founder of Safety and Neil Rath, who is Strategy Insights and Planning Associate Consultant at ZS Associates. So um, without further ado, I think we should get started. And I'm gonna um, ask each of you, our panelists, to introduce yourselves and tell us more about your experience, your area of expertise, and how you determined that a non-academic career was right for you. And why don't we start with Joe? You're muted, Joe. Uh, sorry about that. Um, hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Joe Bernardo. Uh, I am currently working at the Office of Intercultural Affairs at Loyola Marymount University. So the Office of Intercultural Affairs is basically like the diversity office. So we do um, diversity policy as well as programs that promote uh, kind of racial and gender equity here at uh, Loyola Marymount University. Um, so my path to kind of this kind of career is kind of a windy road. I started out as um, I was an undergrad at UC Santa Barbara. I was a Asian American studies and global studies uh, major. And there I was kind of politicized to, uh, uh, you know, work on kind of social equity um, issues. And so right after undergraduate universe, after undergraduate, I went to do a master's in Asian American studies at San Francisco State University. Um, and following that, I actually left academia and went to work at then um, council member Eric Garcetti's office uh, in Los Angeles. He's a council member. Uh, he's currently mayor of Los Angeles, but back then he was a council member. I worked for him and I worked on a number of issues, including like uh, immigrant rights and kind of issues that dealt with the um, Asian American community. We worked on uh, affordable housing. Uh, any number of kind of social equity issues that related to city government. So I worked there about four years and then I went to graduate school. Um, I applied for a PhD programs and I got to the University of Washington and um, I did uh, history and my specialty in that there was um, history of uh, Asian Americans. And so Midway along graduate school, you know, I was there for maybe about six years, but midway, like I kind of decided that I didn't like it anymore. <laughs> I, um, I'll be candid with you. I didn't like the competition, the competitive atmosphere. Um, I was also stubborn. I re really wanted to stay uh, geographically um, local here in Southern California. And um, I was basically wanted to return kind of to a professional life. And so I finished my graduate degree while I was working full time at the Liberty Hill Foundation. And then after that, I worked for, uh, I went back to the mayor's office. He was now mayor. I went to there and worked for, at the Office of Immigrant Affairs. And I did that for a few years. And now I'm here at um, Loyola Marymount University. Thank you, Joe. Shruti, why don't you go next? Hi everybody, uh, my name is Dr. Shruti Kapoor and I'm the founder of Safety, an NGO that educates and empowers young women and girls against gender-based violence. Uh, prior to starting my own organization, I was also an adjunct faculty at Occidental College where I was teaching undergraduates economics. So um, I graduated with a PhD in economics from UC Riverside in 2010 
And my area of specialization uh, at that time was development economics. Uh, I had always been interested in development work, and I was somebody who really uh, enjoyed applied work. Um, and so, you know, when um, in terms of my expertise, I'm, I'm more of an expert on um, data analysis, especially looking at data from developing economies um, and really seeing how that data can tell a story and how we can uh, use that data for policy implementations that will directly impact uh, people's lives. Um, so the question uh, that was asked of me was, how do you determine that a non-academic career was right for you? And um, when I started my PhD program, within a few months, it was very, very clear to me that um, research was, the traditional kind of research was something that I was not interested in. Um, like I mentioned, I was, I was very drawn to data. I was drawn to applied work. And so all throughout my PhD program, um, I planned my courses, I planned my time in a way that, um, you know, I would take the summer off and go to internships at private sector companies. I would go to a lot of consulting work for private sector companies just to understand what it would be like working in the private sector, even though I, you know, I was coming from a research background. And so I used my time, the five years that I had, to really uh, gain those experiences uh, from various kinds of uh, consulting firms. I interned at the World Bank, I interned at the UN, and that provided me a variety of uh, experiences to, to then see what I liked and what I didn't like. Um, and, and then I used my PhD accordingly. So even the research that I did was, you know, I would do more applied work such that um, with, with a focus that when I graduate, I will be able to work for a think tank or a research agency that is, you know, more in lines with practical applications in the developing economy. Um, and so that's how I really tailored my PhD throughout my PhD. I was very clear on what I liked and what I did not like. And I focused more on honing the skills that I liked which was data analysis and, and less focused on the real theoretical research aspect of it. Um, so even while job search, that's how I tailored my job search. I would go for the consulting companies and roles that required less um, of you know, extensive research and more of practical applications. And, and so this is how I use my expertise and determined a non-academic career that which I felt was right for me and that I would excel at. Thank you, Shruti. And last but not least, Neil, and then you introduce yourself, your experience and your and how you chose a non-academic career. Sure. Hi everyone. My name is Neil Rath. Um, I got my PhD at UCLA in a focus in neuromuscular rehab and modeling. Um, I got my undergraduate degree from Georgia Tech, also in biomedical engineering and a, throughout my path, I've always been interested in getting ideas from conception to the actual implementation. So seeing a product and idea go from just its beginning stages to being commercialized and out to those that actually need it. And so I've always had an interest in not only translating technologies, but also higher level strategy work. So uh, both throughout my undergrad and graduate and PhD career, I was trying to maximize my experiences in different facets of uh, getting making com products commercialized. So for I have experience in rapid prototyping, 3D printing, some more of the development side of things, and then also worked for the Office of Intellectual Property to really say how do you, once you have a technology, how do you protect it, how do you patent it, and then how do you go about commercializing it. And in order to get some more hands-on experience, in addition to doing the research and running the uh, basically a small-scale clinical trial, um, in, implementing those skills and refining them through independent consulting. So finding my own uh, clients, working through that commercialization and the, the reaching out to other consulting firms and trying to get more of that experience overall. So I'm happy to address more questions, a lot I can go into, but uh, just a wide variety of experience through different stages of that commercialization process. Well, thank you, Joe, Shruti, and Neil. Welcome to all three of you. Uh, listen to all of our 
watchers today, we do have a, a number of questions that we have pre-prepared or, or that were pre-submitted when we registered for this event. And about midway through, we'll open up um, the panel to questions from the audience, and you can do so through the Q&A mode in Zoom, um, and they'll be delivered to me, and I can address them to um, our panelists. So why don't we get started with our second question, thinking about the focus of today's topic. So we're thinking about how to market your PhD education for non-academic career pathways. So can, starting with Shruti this time, can you tell us how you found success in applying your academic training to your current field? Sure. Uh, so I think it's really uh, crucial to understand what one's strengths are and what one doesn't enjoy doing. And I think uh, that was the key for me always. Uh, so even while during the PhD program, um, you know, like I mentioned, I very quickly realized that I'm not the kinds of not the kind of a person who is interested in doing extensive research, who is interested in publishing journal articles. What I'm really interested in is um, you know, using data to tell, um, for applied work to tell stories, to make policy, um, to use that policy to make a difference in the lives of women and girls. Um, and so I use, I use the coursework during my PhD program accordingly, you know, I would select courses that were more applied in nature, that would give me a chance to work with data, that would give me a chance to use secondary data to tell these stories. I use my um, internship periods uh, for gaining those experiences with the World Bank where I was allowed to work on various projects that again, you know, allowed me to work on my skills and make, uh, allowed me to work on data analytical skills and, and see how policy impacts. Um, and so I think that really was the key for me um, to making that transition from an academic career to a completely non-academic career. You know, as like I mentioned, I'm now in the NGO sector, I'm now in the NGO world which is very different from a private sector world. Uh, but what all throughout my career, what, what, has, what I've stayed true to is, you know, my passion. And, and what I'm really passionate about is, is working in an area for women and girls. So when I was doing my PhD, I was working in the development sector, women and girls. Now that I'm in my, um, you know, in, in my NGO space, I'm still, I'm doing different kind of work, but I'm still the core component of that work is women and girls. And so it was an easy transition for me in terms of the theory, the understanding and the knowledge. What was not easy for me was, you know, to, uh, to see how to run an organization. Uh, I'd never run an organization previously. Um, and so it was a completely new experience. Uh, to hire people, to run an organization, to raise funds for the organization. And that was the part where I, I realized I needed help. I got the help that I needed and I learned on the job. Um, so again, I'm going to stress on the fact that uh, it's, it's always helpful to be honest with yourself and know what your strengths are, to know what you like and what you don't like, and then focus on, on what you like and hone those skills uh, to be able to successfully you know, do the things that you want to do. So uh, that, that in a nutshell was, you know, how I've been able to, to do the work that I'm currently doing well and, and to be recognized for the work that we are doing through safety. Thank you so much, Shruti. Neil, why don't you go next? Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, first, you will start with saying, I don't like the distinction between uh, people bucket academic skills versus industry or non-skills. I think it really comes down to framing and how you go about stating those skills. A lot of it does translate. And so making sure when you tell your story, you're maximizing that those opportunities. So a great example is um, when you're doing a master's or PhD and doing thesis work, essentially you're going through developing a hypothesis, developing um, a way to go about testing those hypotheses, solving those problems, and then synthesizing those solutions. That's exactly what you do in industry too, it's just the manner and the nature of the nuances of doing so slightly change. And so I found success in really, when you're framing and stating your stories, making sure to highlight those components and really focusing on the skills and what are the, their impacts. I mean, there's a skill in being able to distill complex information and being able to convey that to other individuals, which is very common in 
industry itself. You're working on diverse teams where not everyone may be as familiar with, um, you know, if you're making a device or if you're in marketing, like they may not know the nuances of how you actually implement different strategies, but you should be able to simplify it into a higher level. So it's really saying, how do you, what are those skills that you again are you like and enjoy and are good at and how can they translate into a more functional environment? Thank you, Neil. Joe. Great. Um, I mean, I agree with, I echo all of what Shruti and uh, Neil has had to say. Um, you know, I think a lot of skills and a lot of uh, knowledge that you're going to learn happens on the job. Um, and so I think uh, I echo what Shruti says, like, if you, ha if you do have the time, if you're still in school, try to do like internships, um, try to work part time during the summers. Um, you know, make those networks, make those connections, learn kind of what you do like, what you don't like. Um, and then in terms of skills that are transferable uh, between academia and uh, industry, you know, I would say writing. Writing is a key thing, um, especially in a, a lot of, uh, you know, white collar professions. Um, you realize uh, that people's writing really sucks. And, uh, and people who go through academia really have an advantage in terms of uh, writing skills. Um, same with analytical skills and, and research skills. Um, I mean, I kind of was in the humanities um, and I had to kind of learn more social science um, research and social science uh, 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 data analysis. And so um, that, that, that kind of uh, uh, happened on the job. But even with my humanities uh, research background, I was still able to kind of make sense of uh, the different kinds of research that you uh, confront or you deal with in the uh, industry. Um, as well as kind of little mundane things in terms of like organizing and coordinating. Um, I'm sure like in uh, graduate school, you've organized events, you've organized conferences, um, symposiums, um, even like little things like uh, coordinating schedules with professors, uh, trying to get uh, all your professors into one room. Um, I mean, that, that's like a little skill that, you, that I have to do all the time, um, you know, in, in, in industry. Uh, and, you know, just dealing with people, dealing with uh, faculty, for example. Uh, faculty, be, faculty could be divas, you know, and uh, there's a lot of people out there in, in, in different industries that you confront that uh, act just like faculty and you have to deal with them. So uh, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of crossover. So uh, again, what Neil said, there's, um, there's not too much uh, uh, a big divide between academia and industry. Thank you, all three of you. I have to concur. I don't think there's expectation that as you transition from your role as a student or postdoc that you'll have every skill that you need in your next step, that there is expectation that you will get some on-the-job training. And that's uh, a fear that I often hear when I meet one-on-one -on -one with students and postdocs. That being said, though, um, I think a lot of the apprehension when it comes to moving from an academic environment to a non-academic environment is the culture between the two or the differences between the two. So each one of you, this is a question for all three, can you tell us about some of the similarities between the academic world and the professional world? Um, and then also highlight one of the biggest differences that you've noticed between the two. And this time we'll start with Neil. Sure. So kind of echoing what both Truthy and Joe said, I think there's a lot more similarities than differences. Uh, but I think just understanding what those differences are can make the difference in in your experiences as you transition. So similarities, much like Joe said, said a lot of times is being able to communicate effectively. So that's in terms of writing, in terms of being able to uh, be able to interact with your team members. And that could be in terms of you making deliverables or going about actually solving the different types of problems or meeting deadlines as well as communicating the end result so that there's a lot of similarities in the day-to-day -day as well as the long-term kind of project planning and implementation and 
managing schedules. I mean, that's the biggest thing about your defense is not can you defend, but can you get four <laughs> faculty members in the room at the same time? You get the same thing when you have when you're working with managers, directors, VP level, etc. Um, and then I think some of the major differences are really kind of your framing and your, at least when I entered, managing and understanding the expectation of, well, as you've progressed through your academic career, you're basically at the pinnacle of, you know, all of your research, you're the ones in charge of developing the project plan and executing it. When you enter into industry, you don't necessarily start at that same level. So in terms of planning and scheduling, you're on other people's times as well, especially in the consulting industry, service-based industry, clients take precedence. So I think that's one big difference is you, it takes to kind of work your way back to a point where you're fully control, in control of your entire schedule and things also change at a much rapid, more rapid pace. So the movement of how uh, the industry works is a little more fast paced and just takes a bit of adjustment. Thank you. Joe, I think you're next. So I think that would be the biggest difference right there. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, you know, uh, Neil said a lot of the same things I would say. Um, similarities is you're, you know, you're dealing with uh, multiple personalities, different politics, office politics. It's the same in academia, you know, just dealing with um, trying to get a team together, working with different people. Um, those are, you know, some of the similarities. Uh, I think you have a little bit more similarities um, if you go into like student affairs, for example, in higher education, you do a lot with students um, the same way faculty does. Um, I'm not necessarily in student affairs, but uh, I know people who are in student affairs and uh, they deal with students all the time. And so it's, it's similar. It's a similar schedule um, as faculty. With difference, um, I guess one thing is a, a difference is a, uh, you get summers off in academia, <laughs> no, I'm just um, but I think what Neil said is uh, you have less time for um, discernment in industry. It's a lot more fast paced. Things are um, not necessarily analyzed as much. And so you um, kind of have to go with the flow uh, and kind of execute, even though it might not um, be the best final product. Uh, at least, you know, at least in my job. Um, and then I, I just one little thing is I, I have more time on the weekends. I don't know if Shuti is like the same way because, you know, she actually runs a whole organization. But at least for me, I'm an employee that, um, you know, I actually have a weekend and I don't feel guilty when I have fun during the weekend. <laughs> um, I don't have that guilt um, uh, of, say, someone in academia where I have to, like, produce something. I have to read something. I have to write something. Um, but, yeah. Uh, in industry, like I have the enjoyment of the weekend. Thank you, Joe. Shruti. So I would have to agree with both Joe and uh, Neil on this. Um, some of the similarities that I found between academia and professional workplace, um, and this is just from my personal experience again, um, one I found that there are no shortcuts to success, which means no matter what field you're in, you have to put in your time and effort um, in order to see uh, success. So if you're in a PhD program, you know, um, you will have to sit and do the research no matter how much you hate it. Um, you will have to get your research papers out and finally put together your dissertation in order to be able to defend it. The same is true, you know, in, in a non-academic setting, um, you might find shortcuts, but in the long run, they won't serve you well is what I have found. Um, I've also found that, again, no matter which industry you're in, uh, it's really good to have mentors. Um, in the academic setting, you know, it's usually our advisors, our professors. It might be some senior um, in the professional world, in the private sector, or an NGO world. You know, it could be somebody you look up to, a colleague. And, and I think finding those mentors early on uh, who can guide you in your career path really uh, helps. And the third thing I found was um, nothing, nothing speaks louder than your work. Uh, people will always respect you, uh, you know, for your work. And if you're doing good work, 
Uh, so again, no matter what the industry is, um, the only way, um, you know, what speaks louder for you is your work. Your work will always uh, be there uh, for you. So whatever it is that you're doing, you know, do it with passion, be passionate about what you're doing. I, I think that really would be the key uh, in terms of the similarities. Uh, in terms of the difference, I think the biggest difference uh, for me was, um, like I mentioned, academia for me was a space where uh, there was a lot of focus in my PhD program and even in the general, you know, like econ setting uh, on publishing papers and publishing journal articles on the research aspect. And sometimes that would take months, years to get, you know, to get the right publication out. In the real world, it's a little bit more practical. You don't have that much time. Things move a lot more faster. People, like I said, there's a lot more uh, applicability of the theories that, that you have learned. And, and so you want to get things done quickly, uh, get them out, see the impact on people, on products, on organizations, and then move on to the next thing. So, so there is a huge difference in how uh, work is done in the academic setting versus how work is done you know, in a non-academic setting, which I personally feel moves a lot more faster um, and there is a lot more practicality um, in, in their approach in terms of accomplishing things compared to the academia. Thank you, all of you. We're moving to some targeted questions now. We'll start with Joe. Um, from your time at the Liberty Foundation, um, to the, your work with the mayor's office in LA. You've had quite a variety of careers that your path has taken you on. So we're curious how often you've run into other PhD holders in these roles um, and what types of roles might they have played? Sure, um, I, um, in terms of, uh, right now I work at the uh, university. And so you deal with people who who have a lot of, a lot of people who have PhDs um, and a university, whether they're faculty or staff. Um, and so it's a little different there, but in, if you're working outside of a university, for example, when I was working in the, the mayor's office, there's maybe a handful of people who might have PhDs. Um, those with PhDs uh, held like kind of director positions, um, in independent offices, um, and, or they maybe host or they, they, uh, uh, what you call? They were head of projects, um, and so uh, those they use their title a lot. Like those who were um, in those director positions, they used their title as figureheads and they're kind of seen as experts. For example, there was an uh, the director of the Office of Sustainability in the city of Los Angeles. That person had a PhD and always, you know, um, used her title. Uh, but they don't necessarily do a lot of research. They're more like figureheads and uh, they kind of coordinate a lot of uh, uh, work together. Um, they work a lot with research centers, and local universities to get um, data and then they kind of um, develop programs based on that data. So uh, there wasn't much specific research that they did. So it was more of a director, uh, project manager type of roles that um, I encountered when I uh, encountered somebody who I had a PhD, um, but yeah. Thank you, Joe. Um, so Shruti, next question is for you. Um, I hear this often, um, and Neil, I may ask you to jump in on this as well, but um, how, how did you start your own organization and how has your PhD journey kind of helped you with that? And I know, Neil, you've started your own company as well. I, I recall our conversation. So maybe we can jump in on that after Shruti. Sure. Um, so in my case, my uh, post-PhD journey was uh, a tough one. And the reason I say that was because I, uh, I, mean, I was an international student and I was um, on an F1 visa, which meant that uh, for any company or organization to hire me, they would have to sponsor my work permit. Um, and so I had, you know, like everybody else, I had the one year of OPT period during which I um, taught uh, economics. Uh, but once that OPT period was over, it was a hard phase for me. Um, so the one thing that a PhD in uh, an uh, arts field like economics does is it, it really, uh, you know, uh, 
you specialize in a very particular, so I was a, a PhD in development economics. I was not even a macro or a microeconomist, which means I had very limited roles and jobs that I could apply to. So I couldn't apply to be a microeconomist because there were plenty of microeconomists out there. I couldn't apply for roles that call for macroeconomists because there were, you know, hundreds of macroeconomists graduating. And so I had very limited number of jobs as a development economist that I could apply for. And on top of that, uh, I had the restriction of, you know, having this H-1B visa being sponsored. And so when my OPD uh, finished and I had to finish my um, teaching gig with Occidental College, uh, it was a hard phase for me because every time I would find a job, the H-1B quota would be over by then, which means, you know, I, I wouldn't be able to align my visa and my job at the same time. And I remember um, I had a really good position offered by the Bill and Melinda Gates at that time, but it was just after the, the H-1B visa quota had closed, which means I couldn't start work for a couple of months till the next quota opened. And so I was in a phase where I was struggling and I was trying to see how to align, you know, the job, the timing of my job and the visa. And that's when uh, on a personal front, you know, I had to move from the West Coast to the East Coast. Uh, it was exactly during that time when I was in between um, jobs and looking for a job, there was a very uh, horrific rape case that happened in India. Um, that really triggered me and angered me and and that was you know the the starting point of that motivated me to start my own organization so there were two things that were happening at that time one I didn't have a job and so I really had nothing to lose I was you know I when this opportunity came up I was like I'm you know I'm going to go for it Um, I'm going to create work for myself because I was having a hard time finding work Um, And that's when I decided to start my own organization. And I started with the purpose of really educating and empowering women and girls in India. And, you know, that set the ball rolling for me. One thing took off to another. And and we've been doing this work for a couple of years now. So in terms of how I really leveraged my PhD to start the organization, I, I think I'm very far removed from what I learned during my PhD programs in terms of the skills and the theory, etc. But what the PhD uh, program gave me was um, credibility. Um, So, you know, as a PhD, uh, especially, again, in the economics field, it brings a lot of credibility. It it, it signals uh, to people and to organizations you know, that, that, you know, you have a certain level of knowledge about this uh, area. And so I got that credibility when I started my organization. And so, you know, people um, started taking note of the work that we were doing. Um, It also gave me the confidence. And I felt that if I could, you know, spend five years in a PhD program, a place where I didn't enjoy it that much, but I still did a great job and got through it and graduated. Um, there is, you know, nothing that can stop me from learning something new and starting my organization and, and taking that risk. And I, I think uh, that confidence really came from a PhD program where uh, I, I, took an oper- I took a situation where I was struggling with and I still, you know, passed through it with flying colors. And I think that gave me the, gave me the confidence that starting something new, you know, I, I'll do fine. I'll do well. I'll figure it out. Um, and that's how I really leveraged my PhD. And even till this, you know, till, till this date, I think um, uh, a PhD in economics and, and the kind of work that I do in the developing field is, is very complementary and it, it, it brings a lot of value addition to what we do and and that's you know, so i would say yeah, i in hindsight i mean it was the the transition was not seamless and smooth but there is a lot of like uh, compatibility between the two things uh, what i learned and what i'm currently doing that knowledge transfer and transformation was uh, in in my mind now i feel like it it was a natural transition for me Thank you so much, Shruti. Um, Neil, similar question on like starting and how you managed to start your own business, but also you can also tackle how you've leveraged your PhD into a consulting role, because many of our attendees are breast 
interest in that path. Um, so can you offer some advice on that front too, on how that transition has really helped your clients um, from your PhD? Sure. So I'll preface, I mean, if there are any specific questions, I'm happy to address them now or at any other point. But I think I'll tackle the first question of starting my own company. Um, it was a natural kind of progression. So I think especially being in a PhD or even this is brought more broadly a school environment, there's a lot of opportunities. So it's really maximizing the opportunities and mitigating the risk. So, you know, stable research career going throughout um, my career did take a little bit longer than expected, but that's because I was definitely supplementing it with uh, external initiatives, being able to go and seek these opportunities doing internships. And so having always been interested in, really translating technologies being working with strategy um, it, it, incrementally I would try and push myself in put myself in positions where I'm challenged learning translatable skill sets so first is um, on the side I was working for a prospects company doing more product and development so that's really just getting a basis of can you translate can I can I talk not only just talk to the top can I walk the walk that was working for another company in basically research and design. After that, I transitioned into an internship with the Office of Intellectual Property to really look at how do I, how do you protect and technologies and then really commercialize them and basically you want to be able to make money off them, otherwise it's not really going to be sustainable business. From those experiences, um, I was actually fortunate that one of the group, one of the technologies that I was working on providing some feedback, essentially consulting for, had a need for really a CMO type position, really to say, how, how do you get this technology to investors? How do, you, how do you pitch it? How do you get funding to get, get the technology off the ground? And so it was really just incrementally getting exposure and leveraging the opportunities in the networks. And a lot of it was self-driven, so I had to go and seek these opportunities. Um, but then through that, I was able to find my co-founders who are also at uh, UCLA, and then we ended up formulating the company and then ended up currently in the process of hopefully trying to get it to take off. Now, looking into what, so that's really the opportunistic kind of aspect of it is really just saying when you're in this type of environment, everyone loves to work with students. Uh, everyone loves, I mean, who doesn't want to, to teach someone else what they're doing and find value in, okay, this is important to someone else. It's, it's really maximizing that, okay, if you have the opportunity to have people teach you and guide you and learn, it's seeking those mentors and those opportunities that will help you to grow and test and challenge your skill sets in a low risk environment. Um, and I think that's where a lot of those translate into the consulting experience because it's little snapshots and little little nuances you get to learn and get exposure to and we really get challenged in an industry type environment or internship entire environment. And uh, as I'm transitioning, the, when I transitioned into the consulting role is really just taking each of those skill sets to the next level and incrementally trying to get to the point of being as effective as a fifty career. So I think in terms of lecturing, um, the PhD, I think it's really looking at not only how do you put your story and what skills do you have while you're working on your, your own projects. So, um, kind of what Joe was speaking to earlier, truth is really like when you're going through this, you're, you're known as the field expert. So you have, uh, the capabilities of managing your own projects. You know how to do, um, how to not only manage them, but also how to convey that knowledge to other individuals. And then in terms of writing, when you're getting articles and papers published, it's really saying, okay, what is the problem? How did you go about solving it? What was the solution? And then honestly, you're pitching the solution to the broader academic community for them to agree or defend um, or push against to really develop and expand knowledge. So I think a lot of them are very interrelated and talking a little more general, but happy to address any more specific questions. We do have, not related to that, thank you, Neil, but we have our first audience submitted question. This one comes from Dahlia. And they ask, how do you navigate employers perceiving you as overqualified and or inexperienced in the workforce after having spent several years in a PhD program? 
It's not directed towards anyone, so it's probably the whole panel. So whoever would like to feel free. I can talk to speak to this because I definitely faced this question in each one of my interviews. But it, it's going back to breaking down what is the PhD. So it's not just, oh, I received this degree and focus on this project. It's saying I'm applying my skill sets in problem solving and what the PhD allows you to do, or even or master's PhD, any higher education is saying I can distill information and I can really focus on a problem and get the knowledge and expertise to be able to solve it. So it's really speaking to the capability of I can go dive deep into, into a topic, become an expert, and that translates to end the industry. Like essentially that's, that's what happens when you get into an industry role. The only way you grow is you become a field expert or something you're known for and you grow and develop and expand that, that the area of expertise or that, that vertical, for instance. And so really speaking to, again, the skill component of it versus uh, I did, I focused on like neuromuscular rehab with, with these individuals and really just focusing on the specific topic and trying to really broaden where else can those be applied. Shruti has something to add. Thank you, Neil. Thanks, Neil. Uh, so I um, experienced the same. Um, a lot of the roles that I were applying to, you know, I was probably overqualified because once you have the PhD tag, you know, you can't really apply to roles that say analyst, you're overqualified for it. Um, also what happens is um, if you're in your job search and you're not seeing results quickly enough, it uh, somehow makes you a little bit more desperate. And so what you start end up doing is you start applying to everything that's out there. You're like, you know, I'm going to apply to an entry level because all you really want is a job at that point after a long extended period of searching for jobs. And so I would, I would, um, you know, urge um, career uh, job seekers to be careful of that trap because if you do end up applying to, you know, jobs that uh, that the requirement where the requirement is only a bachelor's or a master's degree, then yes, you are overqualified for those jobs. Uh, but like Neil rightly pointed out, what you need to do is really um, focus and highlight in your resume the skill set that you are bringing along with the knowledge set. So it's not that I have a PhD in development economics and you know I'm I'm just talking all about um, rural electrification that's you know that's not what what one needs to focus on what one needs to focus on is that hey you know I have a skill set of taking really complex data and and seeing the story that that data is telling and and using that data for uh, you know a policy implication or how education can help uh, women or how you know uh, malnutrition can be solved so you you need to be able to really highlight those skills through your CV when applying for roles and not just get stuck in here are the courses that I took and here are the grades that I got in those courses because, um, you know, that, that can backfire um, really quickly in your, in your job search. So uh, one, one really read the job description well and, and see what their minimum requirement is. You know, if, if a job really wants, a bachelor's degree or a high school graduate, then you are probably over, overqualified as a PhD candidate. And secondly, highlight on the skills that you're bringing to the table rather than what you did in your PhD program in terms of the knowledge and the content. And Joe, you said you had something to contribute as well. Oh, just it's actually, it's just the same things that uh, Neil Shruti has said. Um, I would just highlight the skills um, as opposed to the content uh, that uh, the content knowledge that you have. Um, and so, for example, presentation skills um, as a graduate student, you're, you're teaching classes um, or a lot of you maybe teaching classes, you're presenting papers. Um, and so presentation skills are important. Writing skills are important. Uh, research and analytical skills are very important. So um, also it, it depends on the, the job that you're applying for. So read the CV, care, uh, read the um, uh, job description carefully and tailor your resume towards that. But yeah, highlight the skills uh, of 
what you have done in graduate school and not necessarily just um, um, maybe not just grad school, graduate school, but also things you've done outside, like any kind of organizations that you've been a part of or any kind of uh, um, uh, anything that you've, you've kind of produced or organized. Um, that's, those, are, those skills are also important. So I would highlight those as well. We have one submitted question for Joe, but I just want to remind everyone in the audience that you can submit questions via the Q&A button at the bottom of their screen. Um, so thank you to those who have done so. This next one is for Joe and it's from Heidi. Um, how does one leverage skills, not content knowledge, when moving away from the academic world? Do you have a specific advice on how to find potential roles? So I think it kind of fits nicely with what you were just saying. Yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. I mean, just, uh, uh um, like, th like I would put on a resume, for example, like I organized such and such conference, I organized such and such symposium, or I presented, um, you know, uh, I presented, uh, not necessarily a paper, but I, I presented, um, I did like a presentation for a historical society or anything outside of uh, the classroom, or I, I guess lectured, uh, let's see, um, yeah, I, I would I would kind of highlight those kind of skills uh, and and anything any kind of uh, organizations or any kind of projects that you worked on um, while in graduate school. Uh, I would put that in the resume. Yeah, if you don't mind me jumping in here as well, kind of to echo that um, many projects you work with, you're working with a range of team members, or you're managing multiple undergraduate students who are helping you with their projects so really in your resume quantifying those definitely adds value because what from an employer standpoint they're looking at what is the impact that you've done are you someone we can work with and can be a team player and then produce results having the degree and title on the papers already kind of proved you have the results so they're really looking for all those secondary aspects so oh i, I was able to manage eight undergraduate students uh, throughout my projects. So, okay, that gives a scope of, okay, this is, you're basically doing project management and you can, you're an effective team member. Um, similarly, it's like, I've been, to Joe's point, presentation skills are highly important. Can you really translate the knowledge that you've gained and be able to communicate that to others? So saying, oh, I was able to present three or five um, presentations. I was teaching this class of 20 students, um, like those, those type of quantified factors give a sense of really what is the impact and that it, the skills are translatable. I would have to echo all that. I think something that I say to every student or postdoc that comes into my office is how, how, you know, describe what your skills are and what your accomplishments are using those skills and then how that translates and what you can do for the company you're applying for a job in. You can, give them a vision of how you're going to be to fit in that company, be a part of the team. And that will just, that's one step closer to getting that interview. Um, switching gears a little bit. Um, our next question um, is about how you navigate the discussion about leaving academia. So a current PhD student who will graduate next year submitted this question. They have not yet told their advisor that they're interested in a career outside of the academy. So do you have any advice for them on how to bring this up with their advisor? Um, yeah, I could say that, uh, you know, I didn't have the best relationship with my advisor. Um, it wasn't necessarily like a, a hostile one or anything like that. It's just that uh, sometimes we didn't see eye to eye. Um, but, you know, there was this kind of, kind of, uh, paternal relationship, if you want to call it that, uh, between advisor and student. And um, I basically just had to rip the Band-Aid off. Like it's, <laughs> like it's a scary conversation to have sometimes because uh, no matter what you say, they might not understand uh, where you're coming from. And, um, you know, they also don't understand because it's also a privilege to be a uh, part of, uh, to have a tenure track position um, at a university. So, um, at the end of the day, you really have to do something for yourself um, and to follow your own passion. And, it, it, you know, it's basically your life, not theirs. Um, so I would just say have that conversation, just be confident um, and then just treat it like 
you know, it's like ripping a Band-Aid. Just do it real quick. And, um, you know, so whatever happens after that, whatever comes of your relationship after that, then it happens. Uh, I basically told my advisor that I wanted to finish my degree, but I did not want to uh, continue on to uh, join the market or try to go on to a tenure track um, tenure track life. So I think he respected it. He didn't really understand it. But um, at the end of the day, it was my life, so I had to tell him. True tea. Um, I would say a lot of it depends on your relationship with your advisor. So um, I, uh, you know, I very early knew that I wanted to be in the private sector. I wanted to work for an international organization or, or be, you know, doing consulting work. Um, and, and I did tell my advisor and he respected that because he too had been involved in that kind of work apart from academia he too had been like a consultant at the world bank or were doing these other things and so um i think for for both of us what was important was when i graduate that i get uh, get a job get the right job that that i'm interested in um and i i graduated at a time where the market was really bad and so and so it was not a difficult conversation personally for me to have, but like Joe said, you know, it's it's at the end of a day, it's it's important uh, to understand that this is what you want and this is your life and your career, and and maybe your advisor uh, will be pissed off with you or might not like this, you know, you sharing this information with them or might discourage you, but uh, you have to be true to yourself because you're going to be spending, you know, the next few years of your life doing that thing, and and so. Um, a lot of time we get influenced by people, you know, by advisors, our mentors and, and go on the wrong track because they influenced us or pushed us to go in that direction. But, but that doesn't give us the happiness. So that won't uh, make us passionate about the work that we're doing. And so, uh, yeah, just be honest to yourself, um, you know, and, and if you have to share that news and, uh, but a good advisor student relationship, uh, if you have a good one. It, it probably won't have such an adverse uh, impact on your relationship, I would say. I would concur. It's always about the relationship you have with your advisor. Uh, this comes up often in my, if I could chime in on this too, this comes up often in my advising appointments, but I think it's part of a culture, just a shift, a different culture uh, between academia and the rest of the world. So in academia, like having the support of your PhD or postdoc advisor is needed to get a faculty job. And in the rest of the world, that isn't quite always, that is rarely the case. So you can, I, you can find a non-academic position without ever having to have your current advisor involved. And so um, just like when you get out into the, the working force, you never tell your current employer that you're on the job looking for a new job. So I think that's, that can be a rule you can follow if you don't have a great um, relationship with your advisor or if you're concerned what the response would be when you say you want to pursue a non-academic career. That said, we have a, another submitted question from Gigi and it's for Neil. Um, how do you communicate your value, i.e. your salary, to potential employers without implying that you are overqualified? So I think there's a lot of nuances kind of based on this question. Um, I think the value and salary are two distinct. They're a, little, they're a little bit different. So I think really looks at, you have to consider the entire package and look at based on what you want to do, what roles you're applying for, what are the industry standards, and then understanding what the where you fall within that range. And that's kind of how you can ground yourself in, in that in that setting and then be able to negotiate throughout it. And that that's where um, highlighting your actual the actual impact. So what what skills you've actually done, what things have actually translated will be how you can convey additional value. So going back to kind of in those in the resume stating, okay, I posted a lot of different like maybe four different conferences i was able to speak at those i was teaching students that speaks to my ability to convey knowledge and to manage individuals um 
in and then any internship or any practical experience, whether it could be voluntary or paid, uh, both translate. So really it's citing those instances and the more instances you have of those, uh, the easier it is to convey that knowledge. But again, that doesn't have to be distinct from academia. It's really just how do you pitch that story and then what is the main objective you want? So for me, for instance, there had a salary that I was my like, non-negotiable base. And then beyond that, it was really dependent on the entire package. And for me, being in a growth mindset, I was looking for what would be the best opportunity for me to get to where I would like to be in the next three to five years. Even if that means taking a lower salary at this point could position me into getting what I would want and being in a position where I could also like, I wanted to be a strategist. I wanted to be helping make decisions or developing them myself to really get technologies out to those that need it. And so that helped guide my decision-making process. But going back to, I guess, the really specifics is really deciding what you've done, how have they translated, what the impacts have been, and then quantifying them as best as possible. And then making sure they align with what are the industry standards. So you can go through like Glassdoor, talk to individuals that work at these companies to really see what that range is and if that's not necessarily where it falls within your salary expectations well maybe you need to be seeking other roles or maybe you need to reevaluate what the entire package is or um, consider what other opportunities are there well thank you neil um, we're about four minutes to the hour um, so we're wrapping up soon but before we do so let's have some final words of advice from our panelists so let's start in alphabetical order with joe and then Shruti and Neil. And if you could also include, if you are open to being contact, but contacted by anyone who participated today, um, just describe how to do so. Yeah, um, again, I would just follow your passion, follow uh, any kind of um, uh, interests that you have, um, and then just see what's out there. Keep exploring. Uh, the first job you get out of out of school won't be necessarily be your last, so just continue to explore. Um, and I guess another piece of advice I would give is, uh, whatever you do, whatever job that you have outside of academia, um, I you were you were in academia uh, for a reason, and so I wouldn't necessarily like suppress whatever kind of interest that you have uh, within academia. So if you can do any kind of research, any kind of teaching, um, whether it be like a even uh, unorthodox teaching like a blog or a podcast or anything like that, keep on doing that. Um, there's other ways to learn outside of a classroom. So uh, if you want to teach, teach outside of a classroom. Um, you know, those are the little alternate, alternative types of teaching. Uh, so that would be my advice. And if you have any uh, questions or anything, you can feel free to um, contact me through LinkedIn or email me at josephbernardo818 at gmail.com. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Shruti. Uh, so my advice would be similar. I think what's really important is to, to do something that you are really interested in and that makes you happy. Um, I also realize that we are living in a really interesting times in, in terms of uh, different modes of communication. So I'm a big proponent of social media. Um, and if you haven't really adopted to social media, um, you know, in your professional setting, I urge you to explore that route. Uh, there are plenty of employers, good people, experts, and potential mentors that you can find through social media if you feel like you don't have that in your current network and you want to grow that. Um, there are plenty of opportunities, you know, you know, you don't no longer need to be a journalist or working for a newspaper or a magazine to be a writer. If you have the expertise and the knowledge, you can just go and start blogging on medium. So I would, I would urge you to, to explore creative avenues to, to put out your skills and content out there. So that makes you more visible, um, you know, to people. Um, not everything is is about, 
you know, that, that job or getting that job when you graduate, because you know what, you might end up getting a job, but that not that uh, in a few months, you might realize that that's not the best job for you. And so I think what's really important is to focus on what you enjoy doing. uh, Because if you, if you find what you enjoy doing, you will eventually excel at it. Um, You will gain the expertise and the knowledge. Um, So yeah, focus on that use uh, different avenues like social media to build your network, to build, you know, to find the right people in your field, to connect with them, to explore opportunities. Uh, This is really an interesting time where you have these options available and you don't have to go the traditional route of, you know, um, attending just networking events or sending your resume uh, online only and applying to these jobs online only. So I would explore, urge you to explore those options also. Thank you, Shruti and Neo. Sure, I guess uh, there's three main components that I would say to focus on. First, when you're transitioning, prioritize and strategize what are the top two, three non-negotiables that you want to or seek to gain from your next experience. So from that job, is it uh, to learn certain skill sets? Is it a certain salary? Is it uh, um, building a certain network? Whatever those are, make sure you you know what what they are and prioritize in order what is most important to you. The second thing would be seek mentors, individuals have gone through that path because they can provide the most specific guidance to one, ensure that you're achieving in that role what you expect to. So that's from your strategy and the prioritized items that you just did, as well as um, methods and techniques that you can use into getting into those types of roles. And then um, being able to practice, you know, interviewing or the skills that are required to really get you to be successful when you enter that role. And the third thing is just start early. Um, and since you've already prioritized, you have the means and capability, everyone is capable. You wouldn't be in a program so in the ones that you're in right now if you didn't have those skill sets. So starting early allows you the virtue of being able and willing to walk away if it's not the right opportunity until that right one comes along. And that being said, I'm uh, happy to follow. If anyone wants to follow up with me, they can reach me at renal.neil.rath at gmail.com. And I'm happy to uh, address any other questions. Well, I want to say thank you to Joe, Shruti, and Neil for being our panelists today. Thank you to everyone who is viewing. I celebrate that you are exploring your careers um, and I wish all of you the best. There is a survey that will pop up um, after this um, panel is over. So please participate. And it was a pleasure speaking to all of you and disseminating some information about how to make some great career decisions. Thank you everyone. Mike, I do want to add that if anybody wants to reach out to me, they can do so. Um, on social media and they can connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn. Uh, And my email is Shruti, my first name, S-H-R-U-T-I at safety, S-A-Y-F-T-Y dot com. Excellent. Thank you. And same for me as well, um, LinkedIn or my UCSF email address, which is just michael.matrone at ucsf.edu. So thank you again.